All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I both hate and love us. Yep, yep, yep. Today, Erin, we are talking about some fan fiction that we have read. Oh, shock of all shocks. I know. <laughs> we are six episodes in. That should not be news to you. If it is, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, so our, what is it? It's general tag first, right? Mm-hmm. And the general tag this time around is sick fic. <sighs> I have to cop to something. Sick fic is my, like, ultimate, Ooh. like, fantasy, <gasps> like, Thing I want to have happen to me fanfic Ooh. because when I'm sick I am pathetic <laughs> I lose any semblance of being able to help myself <laughs> I am sad it's Aww, when I mostly buddy. am like I just want someone to give me soup and cuddles oh. it's truly like baby blubbering bad yeah so sick fic is like my fluffiest little deepest fantasy oh, thing which is why I love sick fic. That's so interesting. I, mm-hmm. I think that's something I don't share with you. Not necessarily yeah. that I would I would hate it if someone brought me soup and cuddled me when I felt bad. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just never been a thing. Like, I think... Because I, I had a boyfriend at one point when I, I got sick. Mm-hmm. And it was very sweet. And he brought me, like, a little care package. And it was mm-hmm. very cute. But I just feel miserable always when I'm sick. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't want to see you. <laughs> oh, yeah. My impulse is not that. I think part of it is that my love language is very much acts of service. Oh, I see. So that is a very, like, act of service thing. And yeah. also... Because I'm asexual, sick fic is very often just purely oh, affectionate. That's so true. Like, it'll be like physical intimacy, but it won't necessarily be sexual. Yeah. Because they're like, I don't want to get you sick. So it'll just be like really cute taking care of each other stuff. Fascinating. Which is what a- <laughs> my asexual oh, no. ass fantasizes about. Because so that's what I want. Oh, Aaron, I <laughs> so, hope you get sick soon. So our AU tag this week is college AU. Yeah. Yeah. Which is less of a thing for me. <laughs> I like a good college AU. Yeah. I, this, to me, has always been kind of my... I won't, I won't say go-to, but I l- like top three AUs. I love yeah. a good college AU. All right. Well, yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. I've just... What makes me sad is that I feel like I didn't have that experience because my college was like a 45-minute drive from my house. Oh. So it's like it made no sense to pay room and board. <laughs> And oh. everyone just drove home. Everyone lived with their parents. So oh. I didn't get, like, the the college experience, you know? Like, moving away and, like, getting, like, bonding with people who are also homesick and, like, going home for the holidays. Yeah, so I think that's why I, I have such a soft spot for College AU. Because I'm trying to live the college experience I didn't have. That's fair. I had the very idyllic... Yeah. Like, small liberal arts college experience. Yeah. Everyone lived on campus. I went to a women's college in the so middle of nowhere. Yep. So it had its own culture, its own thing. And, like, so I think because I experienced that version of college, mm-hmm. some college fic doesn't resonate with me the same way that other college fics resonate because we didn't have a... Well, we had a sports culture, but it was mm-hmm. more queer. Um, <laughs> it was, Amazing. like, rugby and crew. Cute. And we didn't have the frat sorority thing. We mm-hmm. didn't have any Greek life. And we didn't have a whole lot of the, like, trappings of a big state school. Mm-hmm. So it was very idyllic, but it was very small. Yeah. I loved my college experience, but it was I recognize that it was fairly niche. I guess we should start with some sick fix. Uh, do you want to go first or shall I? I can go first if you want. Sure. So the sick fic you sent me is called There Flu and You <laughs> by Ikera City. Ikera City. I-K-E-R-A-C-I-T-Y. It is a X-Men First Class 2011 fandom fic on Archive of Our Own. Alan picks his ships and he sticks with them. (laughs) I won't take this from the one who keeps sending me Star Wars. That's fair. (laughs) I'm not allowed to throw stones from my glass house, (laughs) but I will anyway, (laughs) because I live risky. Uh, And the summary of this fic is, the story of Charles' proposal to Eric will never fail to make Charles blush. Eric summarizes it as, he literally threw the ring at me, to which Charles will always protest, there's more to the story than that. Rumor mill verse backstory, how Eric and Charles got engaged. 
I think this is part of a larger series. Oh, series yeah. But it stands alone, I think. Yeah. It's also a proposal fic, Alan. Oh. So it is equal parts sick flick <laughs> and proposal fic. So look who's doing two at ones now. Yeah. Um, I took a page out of your book. Yeah. It's also one of my favorite things that fandom does, which is do the little call out scenes to their own universes yeah. where it's like, okay, there's a larger story. And then this is the story of what happened within that, that uh, I didn't get to. So cute. I love when that shit happens. I loved this. Yeah, It was so cute. It um, was. The story starts by recounting their fourth date. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they've been on three dates up to this point, Eric and Charles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Once again, Eric Lencher and James McAvoy. Yeah. <laughs> Character name, yeah. James McAvoy. I choose to believe it's James McAvoy. I also find James McAvoy very attractive. He's so attractive. Um, they're about to go on their fourth date and Eric gets really sick and kind of stands up Charles. Not intentionally. He Mm -hmm. just doesn't call him. Mm -hmm. And he's just at home, like, on the couch being like, oh, God, I'm in so much misery right now. Oh, shit. I need to call Charles. He's probably at the restaurant. This is really bad. And he calls him about half an hour late and is like, hey. uh," And Charles is like, are you okay? And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it. And Charles is like, you sound awful. <laughs> and Eric's like, you sound I, like you're literally dying. I feel really terrible. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and Charles is like, I'm, what do you need? I'm coming over. I'm no. bringing soup. Eric's I'm, like, I've got Tylenol. I'm fine. And he was like, child, no. <laughs> and he's like, all right, I will be there in three minutes with chicken soup and Tamiflu. Yeah. <laughs> or t- th- Theraflu. <laughs> Tamiflu is the prescription version. Uh-huh. Um, so Charles comes over. And comforts an Eric. And it's very cute. Because yeah. Charles is like, oh, you look worse than I thought you would. <laughs> this is real bad. And, and Eric is just so embarrassed. He's like, I know. I'm a hot mess. You know. And he makes him drink the Theraflu. And he, like, <laughs> mixes it up. And he's like, I know it's gross, but you have to drink it anyway. And he's like, I don't want to. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, like, I relate so hard to Eric right now. Because I'm like, I also hate taking medicine, even when I know it's good for me. So Charles is like, no, you're going to drink it all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's like, kind of strong arms him into taking it. He tucks him in and he's like, okay, like, I'm going to go eat something out of your refrigerator because I'm hungry. And Eric's like, okay, have fun. (laughs) Also, the restaurant takeout menus are by the refrigerator. (laughs) And Charles is like, you don't have any food. What do you (laughs) eat? And he was like, that's why there's takeout menus. And I was like, oh, my God. So he falls asleep and then he wakes up and Charles is asleep on the bed next to him. And it's really cute. And like... It's the first time that he's sort of seen him in a more vulnerable state. Yeah. Because he's very sort of like well put together and very like formal a lot of the time. And this is the first chance that Eric has to see him as soft Charles. Soft Charles. uh... (laughs) There's a line that says, Eric thinks a bit stupidly that he might be in love. Yeah. Oh, he's so sweet. <laughs> he's so cute. And then Charles wakes up and is like, oh, you've still got a fever. Like, are you sick? Like, what's going on? What else can I do for you? Eric is feeling a little bit better, but he, the Theraflu kicking in makes him a little loopy. So he's a little bit more open with yeah. his thoughts than he normally would be. There's a thing where he wakes up the next morning and uh, Eric's like, I have to get to work. And Charles is like, I've already called him for you. Don't even try it. And Eric's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. And his quote is like, will you just marry me and be done with it? Yeah. And Charles is a little taken aback by that. Because again, date four. Yep. Yep. Um, but he was like, ask me again when you're not better, when up. you're not so drugged up. And it was really cute. <gasps> The second half of the fic flashes forward Mm -hmm. a couple of years and they've been together and they're going to go out to eat and Charles gets sick. Ooh, roll reversal. How the turntables. How the (laughs) turntables. So Charles is now sick and Eric Eric comes home and is anticipating just like grabbing something and heading out and then meeting him at the restaurant and finds Charles and is like, oh shit, like, no, we're not going to, no, we're not going to do this. Yeah, so he was at the restaurant and then did not hear anything from Charles. So he rushed home to find out what what was the matter. Yeah, and was like, are you okay? (laughs) Finds him on the couch, like bemoaning his current state of affairs. Exactly. And is like, you are super sick. Oh, no. And Charles is like, no, you are not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to see me. This is ruining everything. Like, we're supposed to be at the restaurant. We have to go. Eric's like, you are sick. (laughs) You're not going to this restaurant right now. And he's like, no, I have a plan. We have reservations. (laughs) This is important. And Eric is like, you are too sick. (laughs) How many more times must I say it? sit down (laughs) and Charles is like no we're gonna go look I can stand up (laughs) and he gets really woozy 
And Eric is like, mm-hmm, yeah, I have a lot of faith in you. Sit your ass down. So he drugs him up with uh, Theraflu. Theraflu. <laughs> and as we know, Theraflu makes people a little loopy. Mm-hmm. So Charles is really upset. And he's like, it was going to be perfect. It was going to be the best thing ever. And Eric's like, what? What are you talking about? Like, what is this? And he goes, the thing, the thing. It was going to be perfect. And he becomes this, like, blubbering mess. <laughs> yeah. And... Eric's like, you, we're not making any sense. Like, what's going on? And then Charles basically just hands him his suit jacket. He, like, so Eric keeps asking, like, well, what's wrong? And at some, at some point, Charles just reaches into his coat pocket, grabs a box, and throws, throws the ring in his general direction. He throws the ring in his general direction, the ring box. And Eric is like, is this what I think it is? And Charles is like, yeah, that's why I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> he's like i'm really sad about this and yeah. i can't believe that this is what happened and like kind of starts crying he's like oh my god i like jumped the gun on this like can you wait until i feel better to reject me because i can't take both yeah. <laughs> and i'm just like oh precious baby i can't believe i showed you that i hate therapy <laughs> that's what he says and Herc's like no 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 no, no. i'm saying yes like wait a minute no no, no. Yeah. i'm saying yes calm down it's okay so he, like, puts the ring on, and he's like, yes, of course, like, this is great. He asks, will, will you really marry me? Like, me. Yeah. And Eric's like, yeah, of course I'm going to marry you. Like, why would you think I would ever say no? Charles harkens back to the will you marry me and just be done with it <laughs> thing. And Eric is like, isn't that exactly what I said to you? And he was like, shut up. <laughs> it was part of the speech I don't get to make because <laughs> I'm sick. Yep. So they, you know, they kiss, and it's great. And Eric's like, okay. Well, we have to do this again when you're not, not drugged yep. up. And Charles is like, I'll probably forget all of this. <laughs> so yeah, you're going to have, we're going to have to do this again. And then Charles passes out because he has a really high fever. Yep, yep. So then the next morning, Charles comes into the kitchen and is like, a little dodgy. <laughs> doesn't fully remember what happened. <laughs> Clearly doesn't remember the proposal. And is like, did we miss dinner? Did, like, what happened? <laughs> Very like, Almost like a like morning after like drinking thing. Uh-huh. But with Fairflu, I need to understand what the after effects of Fairflu We'll buy are. some. We'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is. <laughs> and Eric's like, yeah, we missed dinner. And Charles is like, shh. How long were you sitting there? Like, how much did I fuck this up? And he's about to sort of back away and, like, not do the thing. Yeah. And Eric is like, uh, aren't you gonna ask me a question? (laughs) And Charles is like, hmm? What? (laughs) Me? Your question? What? What are you talking about? And, uh, Eric's like, just ask. Yeah. Just ask me. And Charles is like, uh, uh. (laughs) And Eric's like, the ring is in your right pocket. I put it back. (laughs) Charles is like, fuck. (laughs) Oh, no. And then Eric's like, you asked me already. You gave me the ring. I put it back. So that you might want to ask me again when you weren't delirious off of the flu. And he was like, did I give the speech at least? <laughs> and he's like, no. And I was like, God damn it. I worked really hard. I worked really hard on that speech. I rehearsed it. There were metaphors and special anecdotes. And he's like, you didn't really say anything. You just threw the ring at me. Like, what? You flung the ring box at me. And that's what happened. And Charles is like, well... And then Eric's like, well, I said yes, so it's fine. And Charles is like, you said yes? <laughs> That's Eric's- where you should have started. And then Eric says, you're unusually slow this morning. <laughs> Which is so cute and, like, so, so real life. I was like, That's the partner I want. Yes. And so they, uh, they have a sort of enthusiastic morning and they are going to get married and it's very cute. And it wraps yeah. up with a sort of button at the end where they're talking about their wedding and, you know, uh, yeah. what they're going to do next and, you know, how big their wedding is going to be. And then, all the logistics. All the logistics. Um, and then it sort of has a thing where Charles says something like, I'll get the Theraflu ready. And it becomes this like euphemism for sex yes, that's right. amongst their friend group who have like heard this story now, which is super funny. So I guess Eric is kind of a dick at work. And the end of the fic talks about him getting a little bit of like razzing from his staff, but like being really happy and yeah. you know, sort of reveling in the new, the newly engaged of it all. And I loved it. Oh, yeah. I'm I glad. was very happy about it. It ticked every box <laughs> Whoa, for me. We made it, everyone. Made it. Six episodes. We did it. Alan <laughs> did a good thing. Yes. <laughs> so I would rate this like 
4.6. Oh! It, like, rounds up to 5. Oh, my God! I just wish it was longer, frankly. I need to go back and read the series yeah. that it's in, is the thing. Because I want it to be longer, and by golly, it is! <laughs> this is a piece of another thing, so I'm gonna go and read the rest of the series. Yeah. But, yeah, it was delightful, and I liked the characterization of both of them, that yeah. they were both one way on the surface, but different, like, softer versions of themselves in yeah. private. Like, that resonated a lot. As I mentioned earlier, I love a sick fic. <laughs> Because it speaks to me personally. Yes. And I love I love the like intimacy thing of it. I love when sick fics are about just how kind you can be to somebody Aww. and how like sweet a relationship can be. And this was sweet but still a little edgy. Like it's got a little bit of kick to it. Yeah. <laughs> which I think is really great. Like when people can be a little sassy to each other yeah. but know when to like dial it down and when mm-hmm. to yeah, that balance is really hard to get right. And yeah. I think this balance is really well between the like oh, yeah. I'm making fun of you, but also like I obviously love and care about you very much and want you to feel better. So I loved it. <laughs> All right, Thanks that's everyone. it, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> the show is done. You say that every time I give you a compliment on the thing. You're like, I'm it's leaving. been so long, especially after the last episode. I, know. I feel like. So, listeners at home, I've eaten since the last episode, (laughs) which means I'm a lot less mean now. (laughs) What what was your quote? I have some potatoes in me now. I have some potatoes in me now. (laughs) All right. Anyway. So, let's go to the one you sent me. Yeah. It's called No Longer Alone. Uh, It's on Archive of Our Own, and it is a Star Wars fic. (laughs) No one is surprised. Uh, this is what this is another. I really shouldn't make fun of you for sticking to your ships. <laughs> no, I really shouldn't. That's why I was like, excuse me. Glass house. Uh, so this is a Star Wars fic, and it's what do you call it? It's like a a, tr- a three person relationship. Is it's there a poly ship? Poly ship. Thank you. I was like, yeah. I know there's a word. I don't use it. Yeah. A poly ship between. When you told me you don't read poly ships, I was like, oh boy, he's gonna have some learning. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, this is a poly ship between Poe Dameron, Finn, and Ray. And. Read the tags. What are they to each other? Oh, they they are they are partners. They are all partners. They are all partners all together. All three of them are partners together. Yes. It's important to me that you knew that. Yes. I, I learned. <laughs> Yay. So it's called No Longer Alone. Did not realize that it was by two authors. Yeah. It's, it's, so this is that thing where they switch off, right? I would imagine. I guess so. Or they just did it together and it's on both of their accounts. Oh. Yeah, I don't know how that works, actually. Yeah, because, like, there's a period in fan fiction where, like, you would role play. Yeah. And then you would alternate paragraphs, and it became this very, like, Frankenstein's monster of a yeah. fan fiction. And if you read some of them, some of them still read that way, where it's like... <laughs> yeah, where you're like, what is happening? Yeah, so I guess it's kind of like a, a good thing that I didn't realize that it was two authors. Yeah, this reads to me like one thing that they maybe worked on together. Yeah, and, like, like brainstorm. They had, like, a Google Doc or something. <laughs> And they posted it, and it's on both their accounts because they're so co-authors. That's so true. Interesting. I, hadn't I don't even, know though. I hadn't even thought about like what Google Docs notes. has made has turned like fan fiction writing into. Because they used to be like used to IM people, but now you can like work real time with someone and like oh beta. Oh my god. <gasps> That's true. Yeah. So it has it has two authors credited. So the authors are a singer of songs and May Glenn with two N's. The summary is quite long. It's an actual excerpt, but I'll read it for you anyway because consistency. Ray recognized the illness coming on for a few days. She had been sick before on Jakku, though not often. If she had been sick often or very badly, she might have died with no one to care for her. She remembered once curling up in her... Is it at at, at? or yep, I, 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 I choose at at. Great. Because so, it's cuter. Yep, so we're going to call it at at. Caitlin, at us and tell us if it's right yeah. or not. She remembered once curling up in her at at and barring the door, but Tito had, gotten, had got in and stolen her food while she slept anyway. So knowing she was sick made her paranoid and crabby. As she was working on the Falcon, Chewie said something which she couldn't even understand because her head had gotten muddled, and she threw the tool she was working with across the room to cover up the fact that she couldn't hold it right and screamed at him to leave her alone. Chewbacca had shouted right back and stormed off, which, all things considered, made her feel a bit better. She didn't like being a bully. She had just stood up to go after him when everything around her spun and then went dark, and she dropped like a load of bricks. Which would have been fine had she not been standing at the top of the Falcon's ramp. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. Yeah, that summary, is, it's the type of summary where they just took a chunk of what they wrote. Not only that, but they, they cut a, a few parts of it, so like, yeah. it's technically a summary, and it's kind of not really, an, yeah. It's not a great summary, because I think those summaries can work, but are harder. Especially when it's such a large chunk of text. Yeah. I feel like I wanted to like this more than I did. That's fair. Please, please ex- explain. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, because I haven't been in this, like, in this particular... This is the second poly ship that you sent to me. Mm-hmm. The first one was Crack. And I had to ask you, I was like, I don't understand if they were together. Um, so it wasn't like... 
I wasn't established there. And mm-hmm. now I was like, okay, I know this is like three people. So I was like, I'm I'm, full, I'm fully ready. But because it's such a like niche thing, like they're sick and that's the thing. I feel like it's hard. It was hard for me to come to that and like connect with the fact that mm. all three of them are together because i feel like something like i i need to read something where it introduces the fact and then like they get together and they make that decision oh. when it's an established poly ship i because i'm new to it i'm still like mm. getting my wits about me about what it is interesting so, so i was working with that against me i definitely see all of the things that you were talking about about how you just like want someone to like talk mm-hmm. nicely to you and like yep. comforting and because it was all that we are learning a thing about <laughs> you today <laughs> It was one, like, it was lovely. So the major problem here is that Ray gets sick. She comes down with the Star Wars equivalent of chicken pox. Yeah. There's a vaccine for you to, that you're supposed to get as a child. That means that you shouldn't get it anymore. Mm-hmm. But because she was abandoned, she didn't have, like, health care in Jakku. She was not vaccinated. <laughs> exactly. She got it. And it's that whole thing of, like, <gasps> it's more serious when you're an adult than it is when you're a kid. So she's sick. And because she was abandoned, she's coping with all of those issues, the thought of, like, someone is going to leave me. Specifically, she's so afraid that Poe and Finn are going to leave her because she's sick and she can't take care of herself. So she's mm-hmm. dealing with all of that and it's like the big theme of the piece well she also in her sort of delirium is very self-protective oh yeah absolutely and she doesn't really want to like be touched and she doesn't want to be alone but she also doesn't feel safe yeah and it's that dichotomy that mm-hmm. is really like angsty and yep. like juicy oh, of course yeah. the angst you love the angst <laughs> I do um yeah so uh, kind of like what it was mentioned in the excerpt was the the whole like she, she tried curling up with all her stuff but it's, it got stolen anyway with all her food while she was sick in Jakku mm-hmm. so there's this portion in the in the story where Finn and Poe finally managed to get her to their room so that she can rest and she won't sleep unless she has all of the things that are important to her like with her yeah. so she asks for Poe's like flight suit and she, she like, wraps for, herself up in his flight suit and then asks for Finn's jacket that was Poe's jacket and then puts that on too yeah. and then she grabs her bag and then she grabs both of them and doesn't let go and she falls asleep that way yeah. and it's like this like heartbreaking moment where you're like she's just afraid of losing her things and she like won't be able to sleep and like rest unless she yeah. has like, a firm grasp on it so that was really sad uh, one of the biggest things that really kind of started of rubbing me the wrong way real quick was Poe and his fucking nicknames for her. Oh. Like, very often, like, there was not a sentence that was said by Poe that did not have the word sunshine in it. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I would that. So. <laughs> I get that. There's one, the moment that it became too much for me was, I can't find the quote, but I wrote down, what's wrong, Ray, my sunshine? My sun and moons? And I was like, dear God. It's too much. Yeah, well, I'm like, we're You've just, gone too far. we're just things, we're just throwing out things, like my, my sugar honey bus- bucket. <laughs> But I'm that asshole who does that, so, like, <laughs> mostly because I think it's funny. Uh, but you did not think it was I funny. I know. It would be a little gross in real life, yeah. but, like, it's so sickeningly sweet that I it's get just, that. Yeah. Like, you know... I see that. It was almost a little too sickeningly for Let us go me. back to the warm and fuzzies for a hot <laughs> minute, because that's yeah. what works for me. It's very interesting to, again, come into an established poly ship and, like, see how the intimacy looks for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, I was having such a hard time picturing how they were all in the bed together, because in fan fiction, I'm always like the bed is big enough for two people and now there's three people and i'm like okay so whose leg is on hers and where's her hand where is she ha- where does she have her head you have logistical questions exactly i was like That's i just fair. need to see it <laughs> i always have logistical questions so i just don't worry about it you just it. throw it in the box I, yeah it all goes in the box <laughs> it doesn't matter so that was one of the like it wasn't a bad thing it was just one of those things where i was trying to figure out i was like okay how does that look and there's also the thing of she's sick and she's just started her period because of course mm-hmm. and it's like unfortunate and they're yeah so it's like the epitome of like someone taking care of you it is so deeply pitiful yeah and it, it's so good it's so sweet I actually really okay for me like that moment of her having her period and then being like we're gonna go clean you up yeah. and like being willing to do that for her yeah. was so like that is a like an act of intimacy that like spoke to me a lot I was like yeah. the trust inherent in that and I think that was the scene in this mm-hmm. that was like Hmm. Yeah, and it, def- it was like she has never had anybody take care of her. Before. Absolutely, and having somebody, two people in her life that are willing to take care of her to that extent is just so validating and so cute and yeah. so good. And I was like, that's really cute. I wouldn't want anyone to do that for me, but <laughs> <laughs> that's too far. Yeah, but- I definitely read like when I was reading that scene. I very much acknowledged. I was like, it's not going to hit me as hard because I don't. Uh, there's that's never yeah. something that that's going to come up in my life. But I could tell that I was like, yeah, this is a big moment. So now we'll reach the, my favorite part of the whole uh it's a three chapter mm-hmm. um thick 
after they've taken, she's taken a shower, they've cleaned her up, and she's comfy and nice, and now she wants to go to sleep, but she can't fall asleep without, like, hearing them talk or do something, and they fucking burst into, uh, can't help falling in love with you, and that's when I started crying. <laughs> I was like, I can't. There are a few things where, like, it, it'll immediately get me, and it's can't help falling in love with you will always immediately, like, pull at my heartstrings. Then the second chapter becomes very about her abandonment issues and like Luke comes in and talks to her about her past and like reveals mm-hmm. that she's actually like the great granddaughter of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah, and that was a whole thing that I was like, I don't necessarily feel that it belongs in this fic. Like maybe if the fic was longer and we were gonna unpack all that, sure. But I was like, mm, let's go back to them cuddling together. I feel like in both of the Star Wars fics I've sent you recently, mm-hmm. um, the how to handle Ray's backstory question yeah. comes up, and neither one does so in a way that is satisfactory mm-hmm. to you, at least. And, yeah. like, I don't really care. I think the Ray backstory question is so, until it gets wrapped up in canon, is Everyone's always going to be. Take a shot at it. Yeah, something that people try to reckon with, but don't have enough canon inf- information to, like, really fully flesh out. And I guess that makes sense, but my thing is, I feel like you should pick your battles. Yeah. Like, if you're making a sick fic or you're making a hurt comfort, like, it needs to be, like, either the, about the sickness and she's, like, everyone's really worried and then, like, oh, she's going to get better, we're out cuddling, end of sick fic. But then when you try and throw in this, like, backstory and, like, tack it on at the end, it feels like, ah, uh, did we need it? But don't you just want to, like, pepper in a little bit of more nope. suffering? Nope. <laughs> oh, of course, you love some wump. I think it's because the more angsty it gets, the more satisfying the happy ending is. I guess that makes sense. I just, yeah. I, like, I, I need it to have, to come from an organic place. That's fair. Yeah, so th- it, I feel like it failed in that account. And then, the, so the second chapter, yeah, is uh, Luke coming and be like, hey, I've been sitting on this for a while while I figured it out, but you were not abandoned. Your parents died. <laughs> And I was like, whoa. So you're sick and you're an orphan. Good job. <laughs> Which, look, and then Fuck you. she felt better because she, like, the whole thing was like she felt abandoned and she was afraid of yeah. people abandoning her again. So maybe now she can just be afraid of them dying. Yeah. Like, I don't know if this is better or worse. <laughs> exactly. Could you wait until I was healthy again? Yeah. But sure. And so that's the second chapter and they're contending with all that. And then the third chapter is she's in bed in the medical unit, by the way, uh, with Poe and Finn. And she wakes up and she sees the ghost of Obi-Wan Kenobi or like the force image of Obi-Wan Kenobi and they're talking about like why didn't you claim my great grandmother or something and he's like well I would have but I didn't know and then they have the whole discussion about like you know the order because the Jedi order you're not allowed to marry or have children or have uh, any type of relationship that is romantic because it seemed like a weakness at some point mm-hmm. and they talk about how that and like Ray is engaged to be married two times Or, like, once to two people. Polly married. Hey, Polly married. That was an interesting, like, view. And she was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And she's like... And then Obi-Wan Kenobi's like, well... I'm going to eat myself right out of the Jedi program. (laughs) Exactly. And and then Obi-Wan Kenobi's like, the Order. And he's like, well, in hindsight, I guess the Jedi's are gone. So I don't know that the Order worked very well. Do whatever you want to do. Exactly. Yeah, it was was that type of thing. Which I was like, cool. It was a shorter chapter. But again, I was like, this feels like it should be on the end. Like, this should expand into a long-form fic. Yeah. Like, something, like, it feels out of place here in this particular fan fiction, but... That's fine. It was cool. I enjoyed it. I felt comforted. I felt warm. Very warm, because two people on me, I was like, I don't know how to feel about this. (laughs) You were like, I'm envisioning this. Yes, exactly. There's a lot of body heat. (laughs) There's so much body heat. I would give it a a solid 3.2. Okay. Yeah. I can take that. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Let's talk about the college AU I sent you. The college AU you sent me is called College Coffee and Crushes <laughs> by Nameless Underscore Wanderer. It is, wait for it, a Love Simon. There it is. <laughs> Vic. I was waiting for this, honestly. Same. So it is in both Love Simon the movie and Simon vs. the Homo Sapiens Agenda book fandom Mm -hmm. tags. And I haven't read the book, but I've seen the movie. The summary of it is Simon arrives at his lecture class 15 minutes too early, but that's okay because soon he's joined by Bram Greenfield. The two quickly become friends, trying to survive college one cup of coffee at a time and hoping that maybe, just maybe, their crushes will turn into something more. Spoiler, it does. (laughs) (laughs) This was a very sweet, very straightforward, very fluffy, very textbook, very textbook, little college AU. Mm Mm-hmm. But it was really cute, oh, God, and I enjoyed yeah. it. It was very sweet. It was exactly what the summary led yeah. me to believe that it would be. <laughs> so Simon gets to his class, and he's like, 
15 minutes early because you thought it started on the hour. Yeah. But it started at the 15. So we, yeah, all college courses start like that for some odd reason. That, they're at least at weird college. times. Yeah, yeah like, mine was like 8.35 to 12.22. Or like, yeah, it would be something stupid, like that. Like stupid and start and end times. So he gets there and he's the first one in and then Bram comes in and is like, why didn't it start on the hour? And <laughs> Simon's like, I know! And then they weird. get to, you know, talking to each other and they realize that they both came to this college but their best friends went to other colleges on scholarships so mm. they're kind of solo in this new place and they're a little like overwhelmed yeah and they become friends they start getting each other coffee and you know when they're having bad days they make each other talk about their feelings yeah so they start talking about what they want to do and simon's like i don't know i kind of like theater um i might audition for this student musical thing and Bram is like you should do it yeah you should go for it i think you would be great yeah and simon's like you met me six minutes ago <laughs> Why do you think I should do this? And Bram's like, I don't know. You just look like a performer. And he's like, okay. So he does it. He does audition for it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So they become really close friends. And then uh, Simon pulls his first college all-nighter, which is a thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He basically spends all night writing an essay. In this universe, it's because the Wi-Fi went out. And I was like, that's generous. <laughs> I, like, I have been to college. Yep. I did that to myself. Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Wi-Fi was fine. <laughs> I was an idiot. Same. So this is a, a gentle assessment of how college goes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Someone's in for a rude awakening that they're a high school student who wrote this. Yeah. So, yeah, that's true. I feel like whoever wrote this maybe is a high school student because it's yeah. very much like you go to class on time and you yeah. have to attend class. Yeah. Spoiler alert, you do not have to really show up to college classes. No. You should. Absolutely. But like... Yeah, so there, there comes a point where classes don't take attendance anymore. Yeah. And you're just like, I'll show up for the quizzes. Yeah, you show up for the quizzes, you do the reading, and, like, half of it, unless you're in a discussion-based, like, small class, you kind of get away with it, and, like, professors certainly don't show up on time, and, like, (laughs) college is very different from high school. Yeah, and you know, the rule is, if they're 15 minutes late, you can go... (laughs) Oh. That is a rule someone said somewhere. Now every college every student college in the believes US. it. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, he pulls Simon pulls his first on later and he goes to his 8 a.m. class with Bram and Bram is like, you are dysfunctional. Like you are not working. Uh, yeah. you, let's go get coffee. And so Bram's like, wait, we'll just wait until the sign around sheet comes around, sign yeah. ourselves in and then ditch. And he was like, can we do that? And he was like, yeah, it's college. <laughs> Which is totally true. Yep, you correct. can do that in college. <laughs> in fact, you can just text a, a, a classroom and be like, hey, check my name I used out. to, we used to swap back and forth signing each other in all the time. Yep. Sorry, mom. <laughs> Oops. Uh, sorry about that college tuition you paid for. Um, so they go and get coffee and it's like, they just talk about how they're doing in college and how he's like, I don't know, I'm kind of, Simon's like, I'm exhausted and yeah. everything sucks and I don't really know what I'm doing and like, it's a mistake for me being here. And this was a little weird where mm. Bram was like, stop being mean to my friend. And I'm oh like, yeah, I thought that, that was, was real strange. That was a little weird. Yeah. Like, That's not a thing that someone would do and that would go well. Yeah. But I don't worry about it too much. Like, in the box it goes. In the box it goes. But he does, he tries to make Simon realize that he's just being hard at himself unfairly yeah. and should, you know, Get some sleep. <laughs> and basically sends him home, like, asks him if he would go to his soccer game yes. later in that week. And then is like, you should go home and take a nap. Which is actually the worst thing you can do if you pull an all-nighter, by the way. Yeah, because um, then should... your sleep schedule's fucked. Yep, you should just stay awake. Mainline caffeine for a little while and then fall asleep at like 8 p.m. 8 p.m., yep, yep. Uh, yeah, so that's what you do. So he is now invited to this soccer game. Is Taylor... I couldn't remember... In the movie, who Taylor was? I, I I was trying to remember if she was in the movie. I don't think so. I think she, not be? No, I think she uh, she was like the Rachel Berry in the book of, of oh. the, the drama club in his school. Okay. So Taylor, who was a book character who I was unfamiliar with, mm-hmm. on the day of the game, shows up yeah. and happens to be there in support of her right. friend's boyfriend. And so she and Simon are in the stands, like talking. Catching and up. Catching up, hanging out. Um, it's all, they have this whole really adorable interaction where Taylor, it's mentioned that Taylor has mellowed out from like the high strung bitch she was in, in drama, cl- in drama yeah. club. She realizes that she was kind of like little fish in a big, big pond, pond yeah. situation or big Other way, fish, big fish, little pond. pond. Yeah. yeah. And then she went to college and was like, I needed to chill out. Yeah. yeah. And so like Simon's telling her like, yeah, I got like an ensemble part in this like student produced musical. And she's like, great. Tell me when it is. I will be here. Yeah. And it's so sweet. And he's like, oh, you don't have to. Like, I know that it's like, it's a small thing. And she's like, Simon, if it's something that you're in and you're excited about, I would love to come. And it's such a sweet moment. Mm-hmm. So they're catching up in the stands and it's great. Uh, and then, oh, he comes out to her. 
in that moment. He does, that's right. Yeah. And he hasn't really come out to a bunch of people. Yeah. This is presuming that the thing with Martin didn't happen. Yeah, it's like alternate universe. Yeah, he was not outed by anybody. So mm-hmm. at this point, he says something along the lines of, like, it's really just my parents. Like, even my friends don't really know. Yeah, and he, the blue uh, jock thing is not a thing it either. It didn't happen. The show that he's in is about like queer experience mm-hmm. and in discussing the content of the show he talks about how much it resonates with him because he's gay yeah so that's how he comes out to her and he's on he's like i'm honestly not sure why i told you <laughs> and she's like well i'm glad you did but i think like that is such a realistic thing because yeah. oftentimes i find myself coming out about random things and sometimes yeah it's about the fact that i'm gay but honestly i've found myself coming out to people not necessarily about that I'm gay because anyone can tell that I'm gay. Uh, but I remember like once I was getting I was getting dropped off mm-hmm. and I just uh, like poured my guts out about my parents' divorce uh-huh. and I was like. I don't know why I told you that. Sometimes you just have moments of, like, trust and vulnerability yeah, it's with like, people. You it's feel just... like it's it has to come out. And I was like, oh, it has to come out now. It's coming. It's coming. There yeah. it is. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> I vomited some information. Exactly. Too. Yeah. So they wrap up their conversation and she's like, so are you into this Bram guy? Like, what's going yeah. on there? And he's like, yeah, he's cute. And I kind of like him. <laughs> and she's like, well, what? what's the worst that could happen? Like, why don't you tell him? And Simon's like, well... The worst case scenario is he turns out to be a homophobe and he hates me forever. And I lose my only friend. And I lose my only friend in college. That would be bad. Yeah, it would be bad. And Taylor's like, well, I mean, are you sure he's straight? Like, what Proof. are you, yeah. what are you basing all this off of? You have to ask the question. Use your words, Simon. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm actually really good with uncertainty. Like, I'm kind of okay not opening that box. And leaving that question unanswered because I really don't want to ruin the thing that we have. Yeah. Which is fair. Yeah. Yeah. And there's an important thing that happens there is that uh, at some point while he's talking to Taylor, he turns around, he catches Bram's eye uh, mm-hmm. and Bram is looking at them. But he, and it's like, I, he couldn't tell what he, what the expression on Bram's face was. And so he waved, but then Bram like turned around and just never turned to look at Simon the rest of the game. Yeah. So then they go to class the next day yes. or whatever, the next Monday. And Bram is like, really grumpy mm-hmm. really angry yeah and simon's like what happened like and he's like didn't walk his usual path to class yeah and he Bram, was late as opposed to the 15 Bram minutes was early. late and like didn't really speak to him and simon's like what did i do like i'm confused here like it's monday like i get we're all little grumpy gills on monday but like, <laughs> i'm gonna exactly need, like that i'm gonna need you like why are you acting so weird yeah. and bram won't answer so he's like fine we're going to get coffee and i'm buying yeah this is it we're not taking no for an answer thank god and bram is like fine whatever so they get coffee bram is being a little bitter bust <laughs> and Simon's like, will you tell me now why you're angry at me? I guess I'm just going to guess. Okay. Like, I didn't know that Bram was short for Abraham until this weekend. (laughs) And I didn't tell you that. And now I have. And now you're mad at me. (laughs) And he just keeps guessing, like, kind of ridiculous things. And he's like, I can't guess anymore. Like, I can't apologize if I don't know what I did. And Bram is like, did you enjoy the game? (laughs) (laughs) And Simon's like, yeah, I had a great time. Like, it was great. You won. It was great. I saw you. Saw me. I was cheering you on. Yeah. Like, what is so weird about this? And Bram's just like, and Simon's like, look, I'm sorry. Whatever I did, clearly I made you angry. Like, Mm -hmm. clearly I did something wrong. I don't want to lose you as a friend. Can you forgive me? I'm sorry. And Bram's like, no, because I'm being a baby. (laughs) (laughs) I think I just misunderstood something. Yeah. And Simon's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, we're good. And then he's like, oh okay, we're good. And then Bram is like, so why don't you tell me about that girl you like? And Simon goes, (laughs) the record stops. There's a script, like a scritch noise. And he goes, what? (laughs) As you recall, Simon is gay. (laughs) So Bram don't know that. Nope. But Simon do. (laughs) And we do, audience. Yeah. We do. So Bram's like, that girl you invited to the game. And Simon's like, I didn't invite anyone to the game, dude. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And Bram's like, I saw you two. You were, like, chatting and having a good time. Like, I saw it. And Simon's like, Taylor? <laughs> you think Taylor and I? <laughs> That's so funny. Incredible. And uh, Simon's like, we went to school together. We did shows together. Uh, she was there to see, like, her friend's boyfriend. She hugged me. I came out to her in that conversation because I am gay. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. And Bram just goes, oh, Sorry. <laughs> My I bad. didn't. No. And Simon's like, it's fine. I didn't really tell people, but like, I hope this doesn't change how you think of me. And Bram's like, nah, it doesn't really change things because now I think of you as being 10 times braver than I initially thought you were, which is a little cliche. 
And I was like... You are so hateful. I know. I am. <laughs> I'm a hateful queer. It's fine. <laughs> it was just a little... It was a little cliche in the moment. Yeah, but I was that's like, sure. absolutely fair. Okay, fine. So they're good. They walk away yeah. from that conversation. Good. And then Simon performs in his musical. Yeah. It's show night. And Bram comes to the show. As do Martin and Taylor. As do Martin and Taylor, but they are less important. Correct. So... Uh, he comes off the stage and he's like, great. And they're talking, you know, everybody's talking about how great he is. And he goes to find Bram and he finds Bram outside and Bram has a whole bouquet of flowers for him, which is so cute. And he's like, thanks. Like, it's really great. Like I had a good time. And Bram was like, you were so good. And Bram basically says, I've been meaning to tell you I've had a crush on you for a while, pretty much since the moment we met. Cute. And I didn't tell you because I don't really tell people that I'm gay. <laughs> Surprise, And everyone. Simon's like, wait, is that why you were so angry <laughs> after the game? And Bram's like, yeah, I'm dumb. <laughs> so I guess Taylor, at some point during the show, had told him to, like... Yeah, because she sits in, next to him. Get himself together and tell Simon that he likes him. So they get together, and it's like, would you maybe want to get coffee or dinner or lunch or just food with me? And they decide they're going to go on a date, and they get they go, kiss, kissy, kiss. And then they're together, and it's cute. Fin- the end. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. It was very fanfic. Absolutely. It was like a little trope bingo, and uh-huh. I was into it. A little trope bingo. It was cute. I love it. Like, if you want just like a good little feel-good college AU that is sweet yeah. and full of good things, then this is a good option. It was a good one, yeah. I, I was feeling some fluff that day, apparently. Yeah. I was a very soft boy. I did you not want any angst. You were very soft, Alan, that day. <laughs> fluff with a tiny bit of angst in the middle is the yeah. tag. I would argue that that's not even angst. No, not at all. It's gentle, gentle hurt comfort. Yes. <laughs> I would rate this like a 3.7. Nice. It's good. Good. It's yeah. on the upper end for me. Yeah. But it's like... Yeah, it, it doesn't... It's not like... It doesn't push the envelope. It doesn't yeah. like redefine anything. No. It's very... It's very run of the Very mill, solid. It's, very solid. Yeah. But like when you're in that headspace where you just essentially want to read a rom-com... Yeah, exactly. That That's fills it. that need. So what did I send you? Okay, so you sent me. Uh, I'm very excited. Two new fandoms were added to uh-huh. our, our collection. Finally. This episode. We're Woo. only, what, six episodes six in? Six episodes in. So you sent me Be Nothing But Magic by... <laughs> Good luck! <laughs> um, Kopfknote. 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 It's spelled K-O-P-F-K-I-N-O-T-E an archive of our own and it is a the magicians fanfic y'all yep it's quentin and elliot elliot uh, elliot the summary says quentin writes love letters to people he doesn't know for a little bit of cash he's not sure what amount of cash if such an amount even exists is enough to make him write a love letter to elliot wah Thank you. So I should preface this. I have not seen The Magicians and Mm -hmm. I absolutely loathed the first book. And so Mm -hmm. I'm very adamant that I do not want to watch the show. I picked a fanfic that you did not need to see the show at all to Which was, yes, it was very appreciated. Yes, it worked great. The summary, I think, sets us up really well. Quentin has this like business where people, uh, they email this anonymous email saying, uh, you know, can you write a love letter for Erin? And I wanted to say that I love the color of her eyes when she wears her green overalls and stuff like Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Protection. That is my best look. <laughs> Hosier would think so. Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And so eventually he gets an email asking him to write a love letter to Elliot. Uh, Quentin is, you know, hesitant about it because he's like, is it that he doesn't really know him or is it that he like is interested in him? But like Both. Yeah. So it does draw a little bit on the earlier seasons of the show where mm-hmm. Quentin sort of knows of Elliot and Elliot knows of Quentin. Mm-hmm. They are kind of tentatively friends, but they uh, don't know each other super well. Right. And you can read it as Quentin a little bit holding a torch for Elliot and gotcha. Elliot a little bit holding a torch for Quentin, but not acting on it. Gotcha. There's a whole like two or three days where Quentin is like, you know, ignoring this email on his inbox because mm-hmm. he doesn't want to. I mean, like, eventually it's like, hey, I need I need more information. What do you want him to feel when he reads it? Or, like, why do you want to write a letter to him in the first place? And the person just replies, I want Elliot Waugh to know that he is loved and for him to feel loved. I have a headcanon. 
okay, of this okay. fic that I think somebody who like didn't actually interesting want a love letter for Elliot sent it. Yeah, there was a piece of me that was like, did Elliot send this? So email? that's the thing is, uh, spoilers. You never find out who initially sent this letter to yeah. Elliot or wanted to send this letter to Elliot. And I always thought that it was the person. I thought that Elliot was just really sad and wanted to feel yeah. loved, and so he sent it for himself. But I think you could read it that way. You could, but it doesn't ever like he makes no mention of it. You know, right. but I guess that makes sense. And so my thought is like, what if this was actually some poor girl like, holding a torch for this other person, and then they just get together and she just yeah. paid twenty five bucks to like yeah. get two other people together. I choose to believe that it was either Elliot himself or, or like Margo, friend, who yeah. was like just trying to like set him Push up that a little effect, bit. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. But yeah, Penny's the one who delivers uh, the letters for Quentin and their roommates. Mm -hmm. They were roommates. Again, they were roommates. <laughs> and so essentially they start uh, exchanging letters. So Elliot sends a letter back to Quentin, who he doesn't know is Quentin, saying, hey, dear Anonymous, I hate that to admit that I've been kind of waiting for a letter of my own since I heard you were doing this thing. I just thought it would be better written or yeah, something. Yeah, I'm a little like disappointed. That. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's like, I've decided to offer you some critique free of charge so that your love letter writing business may continue to flourish in the future. And so Quentin writes back and like they start this correspondence where they just start like, you know, shooting the shit and like actually revealing things about them. So it's a whole thing of like anonymity makes it feel like you can bear your soul to this person. But Quentin replies, uh, do you, don't call me anonymous. It makes me sound like I'm some kind of weird 4chan hacker dude. You can call me Q. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you absolutely mm -hmm. shitting me right now, like Quentin? How many people do you know with, with the that name, name that starts with Q? Absolutely. And so Ellie, not only it's a dumbass. <laughs> and then somewhere uh in the middle of the fic, they've been corresponding for, like, a week or two. It's set up that Elliot and Quentin will only ever hang out when they meet in, like, the common room or whatnot. Like, yeah. when they happen to be hanging out together they in the common room. They kind of make their paths cross. Exactly. They start to be like, all right, let's hang out. I'm, I'm yeah. doing some studying or whatnot. But at a certain point, they're there, and Margo's talking to Elliot about the letters, and... Elliot is like, well, I don't know who it is. All I know is that Penny delivers them. And Quentin walks in, and Margo's like, Quentin! Isn't Penny your, <laughs> your roommate? And, yeah. and Quentin's like, yeah. yeah. And Elliot's like, I just wonder who Q could be. Quentin, would you? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. what the fuck yeah. is this? It could not be more obvious if you tried. I was so sure that Elliot at that point knew and was going to play along. But yeah. it's not written that way. It's not no. written that he knows. And so in the midst of their letter writing things, like Elliot starts to talk about the fact that he was uh, raised in a farm and that he only got to Columbia. By the way, it's said in Columbia university um so that he only got in based on like a, a scholarship uh, an academic scholarship and talking about like imposter syndrome uh, which is mm -hmm. what quentin was like i feel like i don't belong and elliot's like well shut the fuck up because i'm yeah. a farm boy and i definitely don't belong yeah and he so they like, have there this... are plenty of us out here who are yeah. just trying they to have a nice pet, little pity party in. together yeah yeah so that's what's happening in the letters on the outside they like hang out in this common room and start to make excuses to hang out together and like just spend time together they'll bring each other coffee and all of that good stuff and one of the things that uh, starts to become apparent in Elliot's writing is that he's an alcoholic or that he has an alcohol problem. Is that canon? Yeah. Rough. In the show, particularly early on, Elliot is a heavy partier. Um, and he kind of makes jokes about it. I see. Yeah. And then in the first season, he has to kill the man he had been dating who is possessed by the beast, who is the villain of the first season. Rough. And after that point, Elliot is very heavily on substances to try mm. to, like, deal with the fact that he had to do that. All of that stuff about being raised on a farm and, like, creating himself is something that in the show he shared with that first boyfriend. Aww. And no. it becomes clear through the show that actually the boyfriend had been possessed the whole time. <gasps> no! And didn't, he was like, Elliot's like, did... Was any of it real? Oh like, I don't God. know. That hurts. And then he has to kill him. He's the one who, like, slits his throat oh. in the heat of a, like, battle. I never want to watch the show. Yeah. Ever. And Elliot kind of has a breakdown. I mean, he really can't handle that. And he's very much sort of a lush character. Sure. But there is that recognition that it's kind of a problem. That's rough. Yeah. So in this fic, that is translated into his uh, feeling of not being accepted. His parents, like, are homophobic and, like, don't accept him. And uh, and at one point, there's a day where Elliot is having a bad day. Uh, his father called, like, six times and left, like, six voicemails, and they were all homophobic rants at him and so mm -hmm. forth. And so he's drunk in the common room. It's late. He's in front of the fire. Quentin sits next to him, trying to comfort him. 
And then they end up making out, and then Quentin, like, backs away, knowing what he knows, and he's like, oh, God, I can't. He has a little, like, moment of crisis, because, yeah. like, it's not fair for me to, like, make a move on him when he doesn't know that I am this letter writer. Like, yeah, that That's not sense. fair. But Elliot reads it as him rejecting him, yeah. because he's quote-unquote straight. Straight, yeah. <laughs> and then Elliot sends a, a, a cue, another letter, asking about how he is, and saying, like, I'm not good right now, I kissed this guy... Um, but he panicked because he's stray and like uh, eventually Quentin is in his room tra- debating how to reply to that letter mm-hmm. when there's a knock at his door and it's Elliot and he was like hey I'm supposed to talk to Penny about something and Quentin's like oh well he's not here yet so you can just come in and sit down and he's, he goes off into the kitchen to get like water or something comes back to find Elliot reading the letter from mm-hmm. Elliot to him like yeah. f- essentially figuring out that he's Q uh, took him way too long honestly I can't and on he's like I I'm glad it's you, Quentin. I didn't want it to be anyone else. And then it becomes a thing of, like, Quentin and Elliot kind of reading over the letters and kind of deciding, well, what does this mean? Yeah. And Quentin being like, well, I think we already work well together. Like, Mm -hmm. I think the letters are proof of... um, What do you call it? It's a show thing. Proof of concept. God damn it, Aaron. It's a show thing. So you can understand this without all of this context. Perfectly fine. It's obviously I did, yeah. But in the show... Elliot and Quentin go on an alternate timeline quest Mm -hmm. to solve the mosaic, which is a puzzle. And you have to put together a series of tiles in a mosaic that shows the beauty of all life. And in this episode, they literally grow old together. And then Elliot dies. Quentin gets the key, which is the solution to the puzzle, passes it on. And like that part of the quest is over. Margot resets the timeline. So they come back to where they had left to go Uh on this quest and they don't remember it. No! Yeah, so later in the series... Oh, fuck this. They remember it. I'm so annoyed. They remember the whole thing. They're like, wait, did this actually happen? Like, is this real? And both... I think Elliot goes, it happened. This This is real. And Quentin looks at him and is like, well, why don't we give it a shot? We have proof of concept that we work. We worked together for 50 years. Like... And Elliot says no. <laughs> and says, basically, we were in a situation where we didn't have anyone but each other. Given choices, you wouldn't choose me and I wouldn't choose Aww. you. And Quentin is so heartbroken in that moment. Like, he, the actor who played it was very much like, oh, okay. And, like, he starts crying and, like, it's Aww. really painful. I'm going to go on a rant later oh, about hey, this show. This first. But all of that sort of, like, well, would I, you choose me, all it. of that, that comes from the show. This is so annoying. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's not your fault. Yeah, so the way that that's translated here is Quentin saying we have proof of concept that we would work, look at all these letters, and Elliot being like, no, because the only reason you're choosing me is because of these letters, which mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. That, that's what, it makes sense. Because that's who you are. Yeah, so I was like, all right, weird. And so he turns them down. And then Elliot gets really drunk. Quentin finds him and is like, all right, let's get you get you into your bed and, like, away from, you know, all the drinking. And they have this moment where, like, Elliot essentially pours his heart out and is like, I, you know, I, I'm scared and, like, I, I want to. And I'm trying to find the quotations. He, he, oh. Quentin moves towards the direction of the door. I've never, Elliot says, the words stumbling out and only vaguely in Quentin's direction. I've never loved anyone like I love you. And it's very much that thing where, like, he's very drunk and Quentin is like, well, tell me when you're sober and stuff. <laughs> but then the final the final act is Elliot, he's like, I'm going to read it to you because it's funny. Elliot was waiting. Well, he was doing more than that. He was nursing a hangover in a cup of water in a coffee cup, sitting on a bench and trying to catch Quentin cold water coming out of his class. The plan was simple. Spot Quentin, hand him the letter before the boy can even process what's happening and walk away as fast as he can in his hungover state. Most important of all, be fucking brave. <laughs> and that's incredible because that's not at all what happened. <laughs> None of that happens. No, he, like The, the class, plan goes to shit instantly. <laughs> class lets out and there's way more people than he was expecting. And he's like, oh, where the <laughs> fuck is he? And of course, Quentin comes up behind him and is like, hey. <laughs> no, he's like, fuck! You know? And he's like, I had this letter and it was going to be perfect. And he's like, it's not going to come out great. And I'm sorry, but like, I like I love you, essentially. And he's like, I'm sorry I, I rejected you because I was afraid. And I want to be brave like you. And then they kiss. And like, it's so cute. And then the the, the fic ends with that, with... Uh, Elliot's letter where, that he was gonna give Quentin where he was like I, I wish I had a better way to tell you how much I love you but like that's all I've got and Quentin is like I don't think you need to worry about that and it's so beautifully written 
And that's the end, and it's cute. Uh, I'm going to read you a few quotes, because I loved this fan fiction, and there were some moments that hit me so hard. Like, the way it's written mm-hmm. is so beautiful. It's really good. Uh, so I'm going to read a f- I have three, and I don't remember who said them, so good luck. Oh, and one of them I've already said, but it's longer. Um <clears throat> I've never, he said, the words tumbling out and only vaguely in Quentin's direction, I've never loved anyone like I love you. It was a confession, but not the kind with romantic music swelling in the background with the golden hues of the sun. It was sitting alone in a church pew with your head bowed and your hands clasped, mouthing the words because you're still scared someone might hear it kind of confession. Oh, that hits so... The thought, because I've definitely done that where I've mm-hmm. walked into, like, a church when it's empty or to, like, a basilica and I'll just sit and, like, have a moment to myself. And it's so, like, peaceful and mm-hmm. something about having a confession that is that intimate and it's so powerful and mm-hmm. it's better than just, like, those moments. So I was like... <laughs> you were like, what? Yep. <laughs> oh, this one says, I love you, Quentin said into the hollow of his neck. With the cadence one might use to say the sky is blue... Pigs can't fly, one plus one is two. Like it was just another universally known constant of the cosmos. And I'm like, it's... <laughs> it's so good! It's so good! It's like, it's so natural. Yeah. Like, of course I love you. Ugh. Alan is actively sobbing, y'all. Honestly, I'm, I'm there. It's fine. Oh, and this is from the last letter that Quentin writes to Elliot. I like to think things, the important things at least, happen in the specificity of the in-betweens. Not those big, grandiose moments, but rather in the transitions between them, the opaque details not yet seen. It's about what has seeped into the cracks of the bedroom wall and what lingers in the space behind the fridge and what has been forgotten underneath the couch. I think I'm more fool than brave, but I promise I'm going somewhere with these nooks and crannies you mentioned you were afraid of. (laughs) Oh, like, Mm -hmm. the romance is written so well. And it's Mm -hmm. like that soft type of romance where it's Mm -hmm. like, ugh. So I love this fic for the romance of it. And now getting all the context, it all makes more sense. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand, like, the whole common room thing. Like, did they know each other? Mm -hmm. And then, like, he's an alcoholic. And then he turns him down. And I was like, why would you turn him down? Like, it just made no sense to me. Yeah. But getting all that context of the show, I'm like, oh, it's canon seeping its way into and, like, being Mm -hmm. formed into fan fiction. And I understand that now. Yeah. It's also interesting because The Magicians season one is set in a grad school. Right. Oh, so, is the rest of it not? Th- I kind of. They are grad students. Things go to hell so fast <laughs> that they don't really stay in school. Um, Harry Potter but book But season one is very much set at Break yeah. Bills. They kind of go in and out of the school setting after that point. But this is really kind of drawing from that first season where they are right. really students. So it's kind of funny that it's a college university AU <laughs> of a college setting yeah. story. That's interesting. But it is. Yeah. Because it's... It diverges from the plot Yeah, line. yeah. it's taking them to a different college setting. Love that. So this yeah. fic, uh, very good. It's written beautifully. Like, there's so many more things in there that I couldn't, like, I couldn't just read you the whole fic. If you'd like me to, though. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start doing audio books. Yes. The bonus episodes are just us reading our, our faves. Yeah. It's beautifully written. I do feel like... You don't need to have watched The Magicians, but you're missing out a lot of the context, and it feels very choppy if you don't. Mm -hmm. All in all, I would give this a 4.2. Yay! Very much enjoyed it. Very much sobbed. It makes me sad. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Specifically because of all the stuff you just told me. Yeah. And uh, from a rant I think we're about to go into. Yeah. So, I have feelings about The Magicians, y'all. Yeah. And I have a podcast, which means I get to talk about them. (laughs) I have a lot of feelings. Yeah. So, so really quick spoilers. This is the latest season of The Magicians. Yes. So if you have not, if you're not caught up with The Magicians, stop listening immediately. Yeah, right now. So I got into The Magicians specifically because of Quelliot. Hmm. I think a lot of people did. Right. There was a lot of press and buzz about a canon queer storyline. The showrunners made a big deal out of it. They allowed the actors to talk about it very openly. And it was a big thing. And I think a lot of people jumped on board after specifically both the episode where they went on that quest and had that life together. And then in season four, episode five, where Elliot turns Quentin down and they had that whole thing. Because there was kind of a promise, like a narrative promise, that something was going to come from that. Season four is all about Quentin trying to save Elliot from being possessed by a monster. You don't really need to know why. (laughs) But essentially... Elliot refused to let Quentin sacrifice himself in season three. 
and in doing so became possessed by a monster. Quentin spends season four trying to get him back. And the whole season, they're very sort of narratively building up to Quentin saving Elliot and having a moment to like reconcile. And Elliot in season four, episode five, which was the big one, has to go through while he's possessed in his head. The monster has basically put him in a version of the cottage that they live in on Break Bills, which is his happy place, and traps him there with the last person whose body he inhabited. And he was like, how do I get out of this? Like, how do I break free of the monster's hold? And the guy, Charlton, who was the previous victim of the monster, is like, well, the only way to do it is actually to go through your own consciousness, comb through your most traumatic memories that you do not want to relive to try to find a door. It's not going to be easy. You could die. And Elliot's like, well, fuck. And he spends the whole episode going through all of his past traumas. Oh, my God. Including the time he telekinetically killed someone and realized that's how he had magic. Uh, this um, is this is your yeah, show. You love some wump. I love this show. And this is why I was so excited to get into it, because it was so rich and, like, so interesting. He has memory versions of his friends with him mm-hmm. as he's traveling and going through these memories. Memory version of Quentin says something to him along the lines of, like, well, uh, Elliot says you know, you're very brave, Q, and, like, very generous. And Quinn's like, well, you sacrifice for people you love. Aww. And Elliot just go, literally looks and goes, oh, shit. Aww. I know where we have to go. So he finds the memory of him turning Quentin down, and that's where the door is, which means that's his most traumatic Aww. memory. And in the moment, so <laughs> Alan's crying again. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so memory Elliot turns him down, and then the Elliot that is going through this journey looks at memory Q and kisses him and is like, Q, I need you to know that I am going to fix this when I get out of here. And if I can be braver, it's because of you. (laughs) And goes through the door. And that's the moment where he takes control of his body for the first time all season. Mm. Bear in mind, concurrently, Quentin is about to murder him. Because he thinks it's the only way to get rid of the monster. So in the last moment before they're about to do it, Elliot comes back and is like, Q, it's me. And Quentin's like, Shut, come on, He's like enough games. <laughs> Would you let me kill you, please? You've been a homicidal, like this monster has tortured him, this oh. monster with Elliot's body. So Qu- Quentin is very traumatized. Oh, um, no. And they're about to kill him. And he goes, peaches and plums, motherfucker, I'm alive in here. <laughs> and peaches and plums comes from that mosaic timeline. And it's o- something only Elliot would know. Yeah. And Quentin goes, Elliot? And realizes mm. he's alive. And he's like, I am alive in here. And he thwarts the plan to kill him. And the monster remain, takes back over Elliot's body. No! But Quentin is like, oh, he's alive. I thought he was dead. Yeah. He's alive. The storyline from there devolves so fucking fast. Like, those writers backtracked away from a canon storyline. No! Queer storyline after that. And <sighs> to the extent that, like, in the last two episodes, it feels like they were written by different people. Gross. So... In the last episode of the season, you go through this whole thing and they all of these characters go on these journeys. They reach the point where they know how to get rid of the monster. They know how to get rid of the monster's sister, who is also somebody oh, inherent great. in this. And they come up with a plan. And in the last episode, they depossess Elliot of the monster. He gets like stabbed in the gut in order to do it. He's oh. dying. Quentin, Alice, and Penny go to the mirror realm to get rid of the monster into this thing called the seam, which is a kind of deus ex machina thing. We're not going to worry about it. Sure. And in getting rid of the monster, Quentin sort of, like, passively commits suicide. And it's played as a really heroic thing. Of course. Other people have spoken way more eloquently about why that particular element of the story is problematic than I ever will be able to. Sure. It just was. The way that they played it was not safe. It was not respectful of people with mental illness. And it's also really problematic to have a character who's dealt with suicidal ideation his whole life die by essentially, like, heroic suicide and then go to his own funeral where everybody is, like, better off without Uh, him. no. Yeah, it was bad. Um, Gross. So I'm not going to get too into that, although I agree with all of the fandom sort of assessment of that. It was not a safe or respectful thing to do. The thing that I was most angry about was the kill your gaze queer bait thing that happened. Fan fiction is fixing that for me. Yeah. And I think that's what's so great about fan fiction is that ultimately canon can and often will let you down. Yeah. There's a lot of fiction out there that they had a chance to mm-hmm. make really great and have really great representation, and they chose not to. For one reason or another, they didn't. Fandom has taken this pairing and fucking run with it. 
And it is so restorative Ugh. to have agency over a queer storyline. And so when people sort of disparage fan fiction and talk about it as this sort of pithy thing, it can be. Yeah. But I have such love and respect and there feels such a need, particularly for queer people, to have agency and control over storylines. Absolutely. Where we don't die. Yeah. Where occasionally we might get what we want. Uh-huh. We might have a chance at happiness and we can be full and complicated people yeah. with interesting and complicated storylines and not treat it as disposable or trauma porn. Which is really what the end of that season was, was trauma porn. Yeah. And super queer bait. Um, Because they also had Quentin get back together with his ex-girlfriend oh, Alice right. at the end. And I was not happy about that either. Not that, I mean... We could go off on a whole separate rant about how they never label him with a sexuality. And right. I think it's because the writers conceive of him as a straight man who just dabbles. And the fandom was definitely conceiving him as him, him as bisexual. Mm-hmm. That's a separate issue. <laughs> but because, like, there was a narrative promise that was never fulfilled and was never going to be fulfilled. Because the writers had known that Quentin was going to die in the season finale. So it felt like queer bait to the nth degree and kill your gaze to the nth degree. Which was super frustrating and hurtful. And, like, frankly, like, hurt a lot of people. Yeah. The cast didn't know what was going to happen until, like, the Monday before it aired on a Wednesday. Because they had filmed the dummy ending of the show. Which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, That's insane. Yeah, the dummy ending had Quentin coming back. So, Hale Appleman, who is a queer man, and talked about how important it is to have queer representation in sci-fi. And how happy he was to see Quelliot happen. And how Quelliot was endgame in his heart. Was made complicit in this queer bait without his consent which i think is deeply troubling but i think that's why fan fiction can be so revolutionary in some ways is that it's taking agency and saying fuck you yeah no you don't get to kill us off you don't get to use us as trauma porn we're gonna like really take a look at this narrative Mm -hmm. and see it through and follow through on the you know narrative promises that you bailed on i love that yeah so you know when i get on my high horse about fan fiction that's what it's about for me. I'm glad, yeah. Is it's an avenue to representation by and for the people that it is representing, which is not often the case in canon. Correct. Because the people who own TV stations usually are not the people who are most affected by stuff like that. They don't I need to stop. This is this yeah. is too much emotionally for me to deal with. Yeah. Don't I, watch this show. No, I'm not going to. That has cemented this firmly. The other thing that's really a bummer is that like I had recommended this show to people because Mm -hmm. There was a canon queer storyline, and I think a lot of people did that. And a lot of people did that because there was really good mental health representation in the show and all of this. And it was so ripped away from everybody in that last moment that everybody I know was like, don't watch the show. Don't start, because it's going to be triggering in 18 different ways for you. Like, it's not safe to watch this. So that was really upsetting. But I've never seen fandom rally so hard and so fast before. Right. Because no one in fan, like, at least on my side, like, from what I've been seeing, no one in fandom liked that ending. Mm -hmm. Like, the vast majority of people are saying, that wasn't cool. And it could be for different reasons. Like, people are coming at it with different concerns. Because a lot of people are like, narratively, this didn't make sense. It wasn't a good story. It wasn't a good storyline. And people are like, also, bury your gaze is a really terrible trope to fall into. And also, mental health representation. And also this... The way they treated women in the finale was garbage. There are a million reasons to dislike it. But fandom basically immediately was like, they started a Trevor Project fundraiser and raised like $5,000 super fast um, in the name of the show. People have been really taking care of each other and like basically just writing all these fluffy fix-it fix and being like, (laughs) the tag that has grown wildly in the Mitch's fandom is canon what canon? This is the first time that I've been in a fandom where I feel compelled to comment on people's stories and yeah. be like, hey, I'm really grateful that you're still writing this. Mm-hmm. I was really proud of the way that fandom rallied That's after really that finale. It was the first time wonderful. I'd ever been part of it. And yeah. it was really cool. Well, I think I can't remember of any show in recent history that has pulled this kind of stunt where it's like, it's not just the barrier gay thing, but after like having had seasons of mm-hmm. like, hey, look at this queer relationship. And using it to critical praise. Uh, yeah. Their viewership went up after they started leaning into it. Yeah. I haven't, I can't think of any show in recent history that has done that and then immediately pulled a fucking 180 and pulled yeah. the rug out from under the fans like that. Gleefully. Right, exactly. For, like, fake woke points, too. It's so dumb. Because they were like, we killed our white male protagonist. Isn't that cool? And everyone was like, 
he's a mentally ill bisexual man. Like, no. no. It's not. I, like, yeah. your fundamental lack of understanding of intersectionality is, like, hugely problematic. And there's already, like, uh, rumors or, like, uh, they're trying to backtrack already. Oh, yeah. Big time. I, they're like, well, just because he's not a season regular, Jason Ralph, who plays Quentin, just because he's not a series regular anymore doesn't mean he can't come back. And I was like, you guys came out the gate after that finale with a big thing about how he was off the show forever. Yeah. This is crisis mode. You are now in damage control mode. So now let me ask you, what are we hoping for with magicians? Do we care? Or do we want, like, a retcon? Or do we want it to just, like, fail and go into a large garbage pile? I alternate between a couple of different feelings. I personally will no longer be watching the show. I will be happily living in my little fan fiction fix-it universe with all my other little queer people. Yeah. Doing what the writers were too chicken shit to do. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, a happy, quiet life. Love it. Season five, I don't know if it's better or worse for him to come back, to be honest with you. On the one hand... This is a show where people come back from the dead all the time. Yeah, it sounds like it. So it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for him to come back. Yeah. If that had been the case, I think the problem comes in with all of the extra stuff that they did where they were talking about how he's really off the show and he's Mm -hmm. really dead this time and we didn't even tell the cast until Monday. And, like, any way you cut it, if he comes back... That was a deeply shitty thing to yeah, do. Yeah, like they still made that move to do it. They made that move. And I cannot imagine being on that cast and crew and having been deceived like that. Yeah. That does not make for a safe work environment. No. You know? So I don't know if it would be better for him to come back, given that situation. Yeah. However, of course I would want to see Quelliot like come become through, yeah. canon endgame. But, like, what I'm confused by is that narratively the season finale we got was more of a seat, like a series finale. Mm. It would have been a terrible series finale and yeah. it would have made everyone super angry, but they wrapped up all of the storylines in yeah, such a like, way. Where do you go from here? I don't really care. For sure. Because it's one thing to dig yourself into a hole and then in a season finale and then have everybody be like, well, how are you going to get out of this? This was done for pure shock value and it didn't make any narrative sense and it wasn't done well. Mm-hmm. And then it would have been fine. Like, it would have still been all of those things, but now coupled with the, like, articles and the, like, saying he's really dead and all this shit they pulled in the cast, like, I don't know. I don't know. If I were particularly Hale Appleman, I would have a very hard time going back. Yeah, I would leave. I don't know what kind of contract he's under, but if I were in his shoes, in knowing only what I know of the situation... yeah. If that were the situation I was put in, I would be having a very real conversation with my management team. Yeah. Because that's not a safe work environment. Mm -hmm. So do I kind of want it to end? Yes, from that perspective. But it's such a shitty ending. Yeah. Like you want better for those characters. Yeah. We all, we want better for every single one of them. Yeah. So there's no winning, which is what sucks about it. Because there's no good moving forward. And I certainly don't trust them to fix it. No. So, yeah, I think a lot of people are not going to be watching season five. Good. Yeah. It's a bummer. Let it rot. But plenty of people are writing really fantastic fan fiction. And that's what we should focus on. That is what we should focus on. So thank you, fandom, for being the representation that we actually need and deserve in, you know, particularly queer spaces, but... I love that we do this show in, like, a sense of, like, talking about all of these things about fandom Mm -hmm. and how... Fan fiction isn't just like the weird and like, and we talk, we, yeah, we've talked about it. We talked about it in our pilot, I believe, about like how there's so many podcasts out there that are just, you know, reading the weirdest stories we could find mm-hmm. and stuff. But I enjoy the SpongeBob we, and a duck. Yes, <laughs> They're like, yeah. ew. Yep. Why? Yep. Really appreciative that we, that there's a medium now that we can use to like shine a light on the, all of the positive things that mm-hmm. fan fiction can bring. So. In sort of a stunning, circular way, Mm -hmm. Lev Grossman, who wrote the the original Mm -hmm. Magicians trilogy, has been on the record about talking about fan fiction in a very positive way. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So one of the quotes that has been making the rounds on Tumblr is this quote from him that I'm going to read and that I think really speaks to taking fan fiction seriously in the way that we do. Mm Mm-hmm. Quote, I adore the way fan fiction writers engage with and critique source texts by manipulating them and breaking their rules. Some of it is straight up homage, but a lot of fan fiction is really aggressive towards the source text. One tends to think of it as written by total fanboys and fangirls as a kind of worshipful act, but a lot of times you'll read these stories and it'll be like, what if Star Trek had an openly gay character on the bridge? And of course the point is that they don't, and they wouldn't because they don't have the balls or they are beholden to their advertisers or whatever. 
There's a powerful critique, almost punk-like anger being expressed there, which I find fascinating and interesting and cool. I think that sums up why we love this. Yeah. And why we do this. Thanks, Love Grossman. Thank you. I'm sorry they killed your character. Yeah, I would like to hear what his reaction has been to this. <sighs> He's talked about it a little bit. He yeah. went on a podcast and he talked about how it was kind of a punch in the gut. And he wrote those books when he was coming out of a really bad depressive episode. Yeah. And Quentin really represented him. And to see him <sighs> die on TV was really hard. It's unclear whether or not he had given permission. Right. Sarah Gamble claims that they ran it by him and he said yes. He made it kind of sound like they kind of did and kind of didn't. And yeah. I'm sure the truth lies somewhere in between. Yeah. But that quote has been making the rounds a lot with regards to the magicians and how fandom has been so powerful yeah. in its rebuke and its fixing of it. Exactly. Almost. And refusing to sort of let the narrative be dominated by other people. I mean, yeah. Like, no. Fuck that. This is dumb. <laughs> I like punk like anger. It's good. Because that is what it is. It's very like, well, fuck you and your rules. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make them kissy kiss. <laughs> yeah. And that's revolutionary. So in today some ways. I learned that Aaron and I are punks. Yeah. Hardcore. All right. Well, I think that's a good place. Uh, that's plenty of rant it. for me to edit yeah. <laughs> later. <laughs> I can go on this rant forever, but it's actually unhealthy for me to focus on it. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the probably the last time I will rant about the season finale about the magicians, but I will 100% continue to be sending you Quelly at Fix. Great. Because it has very quickly become the number one thing that I read. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Fic List. Uh, if you have any recommendations, feel free to send them our way. Yeah, we have a Twitter account. So send us your recs. Like, send us some good AUs. Give us your ideas for stuff that we should maybe Or send us stuff about. that you're writing. We would, yeah. We would love to take a look. Absolutely. We are all in this happy little boat together. Yeah. Reading all of our little sick fics and <laughs> college AUs and yep. everything that makes us happy. And sad. Yeah. But... Ultimately very fulfilled. Exactly. Well, till next time. Bye, y'all.